Hello, today's topic is going to be on histology, the study of tissues. More particular, the microscopic study of how cells come together to form very specialized tissues. So histology is the, stu the microscopic study of tissues and we need to see um, normal before we can actually understand histopathology, which would be the field of study where there is disease to tissues. We at this point have already learned about cells and how cells come together to form tissues. We have look, looked inside of cells and we understand a little bit about cell biology, cytology. Um, and so now we know that also that there are more than 200 different types of human cells that come together to form tissues. And we're going to take a look at some of the major categories of these tissues. We also learn from the hierarchy of uh, human anatomy and physiology that the tissues, two or more tissue types, will come together to form organs. So before we can get to organ systems, which I know people uh, always feel a little bit of a relief getting to the organ system since that's something they're familiar with, it's important for you to understand what tissues compose these organs because all disease is at a cellular, molecular, and cellular level which ends up adversely affecting the tissues. So let's get let's get going. Um, the major tissue types are going to, there are four of them and in this chapter we are going to take a look at these four different types and figure out what makes them what kind of what kind of characteristics make them special so um, and what we associate with each of the particular tissue types so there are epithelial connective nervous and muscular tissue categories they are the four major tissue categories so again organs like your stomach your heart your liver your kidneys organs are defined as being composed of two or more of these specialized tissue types, many organs being composed of all four. So um, we, we want to make sure that we understand why it's important that we understand these categories and uh, what, makes, what makes each of them unique. Again, the reason for this is not just academic, it's because there are some diseases that actually attack epithelial tissue or autoimmune diseases that may be attacking connective tissues or diseases that are associated just with the nervous system. So again, unless you know the specialized functions from each of these tissues, you wouldn't really know what the patient might be experiencing or what they have lost. So that's your motivation for um, trying to get the foundation of histology in this particular section. So we do know that what tissues are made of, we do understand that they are composed of cells. When we hear about the fluids that we find in tissues, we often refer to them as extracellular fluid, ACF, extracellular fluid. Sometimes it's also referred to as interstitial fluid or tissue matrixes. These are the fluids that are bathing our cells and sometimes um, being a very playing a very important role of how healthy the cells are interacting together when they form these tissues. So this matrix extracellular material is sometimes referred to in these different ways. And, but again, it's important to understand that each tissue type has usually very specialized types of extracellular fluid. We know we didn't start off as trillions of cells coming together to make up these four tissue types. We started off as one cell, that cell being called a zygote, Z-Y-G-O-T-E, a zygote. That cell was formed when the egg and the sperm uh, joined in a process known as fertilization. And that new cell that was formed, the zygote, started to undergo mitosis and dividing, copying, making a copy of its DNA and dividing and cloning essentially into two new cells and then those two cells divide it and so on and so on. Very early on in embryonic development, 
and you all know that an embryo is two weeks after the zygote is formed until about eight weeks in development, there are going to be these very distinct germ layers that form. These germ layers are going to be the um, really where certain specialized organs and organ systems arise from. These three primary germ layers are called the ecto, which is outer, endo, the prefixes tell you where they're found, inner, and meso, which is the middle. And you can see that the from the ectodermal layer, we're going to have the epidermis, which is skin and nervous system tissues forming. From the endodermal layer, you're going to have uh, the digestive respiratory tracts and the membranes associated with that. And from the endo inner, the middle, you're going to end up having muscle, bone, and blood developing. So we had already previously discussed stem cells and how stem cells are early immature cells that have the potential to become what the body is needing. So as these stem cells are taking on very specialized roles, there's only a particular path that they can take um, after that particular point. And these are referred to as the primary, the three primary germ layers. When we're thinking about histology and looking at the microscopic study of tissues. We do need a microscope to be able to see human cells. And for those cells to be seen, it's going to be very important that we understand how to prepare slides for those. Now, I'm not really going to ask you all any questions about the preparation of slides for histology, but I would want you to have an idea about some of these slides that we're about to see. I would like you to have an idea of what you are looking at. So when you think about a cell, it's obviously three-dimensional. Um, if cells were flat, we'd be flat, but they are three-dimensional. So they give you an example of a cell that might be shaped sort of ovoid or like an oval, sort of like an egg. And a hard-boiled egg you can think of as, as the center part, yolk part, as being the nucleus. So just let's use this analogy that you've got these cells and obviously cells coming together to form these tissues. When a tissue gets sliced for histological examination, this you, you can't macroscopically with your eyes see where you're slicing the actual cells when you slice the tissue. So in this one cell, if it got sliced right here, this is what you would you would see on the slide. If this one cell got sliced here, it would look very different. If it like got sliced down the middle, it would look like this. So we would never expect that when we looked at a human tissue prep, that all the cells would be completely uniform, the way that you sometimes see them illustrated in um, histology studies. We understand when you see a human tissue prep that you may see cells that are the same looking as varied as this on the slide. That would make sense. Another, another explanation of what some of the tissues we're about to see is if you had a tissue that had been biopsied from a patient that had a duct, like maybe it's a sweat gland, who, you know, whatever kind of duct it was, um, where the tissue gets cut, it would look something like this. If the duct got cut here, then you would end up seeing like, you know, you, if it got cut right here, you would end up seeing something like this. If it got cut here, it would look like this to you on the slide prep. And we just expect it to look like this because we understand that these, um, these accessory structures like, like ducts and vessels, blood vessels and whatnot, are not linear and you know they're, they're not so this is what we expect and I'll give you an example of this I'll go down and see it just to show you an example so um, that's a great example here so if we were looking at this duct this duct got sliced in a, a longitudinal way but this duct got sliced transversely so you know like the duct was running but got sliced across right um, and so we expect the cells that are lining these ducts 
to not look exactly the same because some of them you can make out the nucleus because they got cut straight in the middle but some of them you can't and you didn't expect to uh, be able to see the nucleus in all of the cells that are lining these ducts. You didn't even expect to. It wouldn't have even made sense. In this actual human tissue prep, just to show you this, um, they have outlined some of the cells so that you can see them a little bit better, more clearly the outline, the plasma membrane of the cell. But if you look at this area, this is what the actual tissue preps would look like. So again, I'm not going to give you slides to be able to recognize. We, we do usually do that in a laboratory setting, but I, did, I want you to understand um, just a little bit about why I'm explaining how these tissue preps are done in a pathology lab uh, and how they are looked at and what they, what they expect to see on there. So um, let's start with our first category epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue has two major functions and if you hear these words you would want to know that this is epithelial tissue that you're talking about. Epithelial tissue lines, lines uh, organs, and epithelial tissue secretes. So lines and secretes, this would be very important that you would know that these are major functions of this special category known as epithelial tissue. So that's going to be very important for you to know. When we think about a tissue that has the function of lining something, a structure, we would expect the cells to be very close together, and they are. When we look at them on a tissue prep, the cells are very tightly packed together, and these connections are uh, important that they are tightly woven together. Some epithelial is simple, which means that it is just one layer thick, one cell layer thick. And some epithelial tissue is stratified, which means that it has multiple layers, more than one layer, many times multiple layers. Now, because these special cells that make up epithelial tissue are so packed closely together so that they can line, they're very protective and they are avascular, which means that there are no, there's no blood supply that's able to run through them. So no blood vessels can actually get between them. So when you look at this, and I know it's a drawing, but still you can, they've done it so it's sort of accurate. When you look at the base layer of the cells in stratified epithelial, these cells look a particular way. But as these cells are dividing and pushing away, from what would be their nutrient source, the blood vessels, and their nutrient source here at the base, the cells take on a slightly different appearance, slightly different anatomy, because they're moving further and further away from the nutrient source, which would be blood capillaries, bringing nutrients, taking away waste. So we expect when we see stratified epithelial that not every layer of the cells look alike, but it doesn't mean that this cell wasn't this one weeks ago, you know, so before as it was dividing and pushing away from the nutrient layer, we expected the anatomy, the form of the cell to actually kind of change. And when anatomy changes, we understand that physiology, the function of it probably changes somewhat too. So you might be thinking to yourself, where in the body would you want a single layer? Even though they're tightly together, uh, connected together. How could this be very protective if it's a simple epithelial? You can see where if it's stratified it would be pretty protective because it could be many, many, many layers. That seems like that could be very protective. But how can this? And simple isn't really protective. What it is is that it allows for rapid absorption between two areas. So a perfect example to give you of where you find simple epithelial tissue that lines is going to be in capillary blood vessels and in the alveoli of the lungs.
these it's it's kind of amazing to think about these little microscopic air sacs in your lungs the alveoli where oxygen has to rapidly move from one area from the little alveolar sac into a red blood cell found in a blood capillary that oxygen has to move quickly doesn't it and co2 has to move out quickly to be able to move across these two areas you need simple epithelial and simple epithelial does line the alveoli and simple epithelial does line our blood capillaries that's that's how they are formed and that anatomy helps us to understand their function so there are different types of epithelial cells some are cubed shaped some are column like a long column shaped some have really no shape so they're said to be amorphous those are referred to as squamous epithelial some people say squamous um, but squamous epithelial cells are amorphous they have no real shape they're kind of, it's kind of determinant on where the environment that you find them in so um, these are just the different shapes that we see of epithelial and we do know they're tightly packed together they are avascular and you can find them as simple or in some areas stratified like your skin is stratified the inside of your cheek the linings of some of your structures that need protection because there's friction like the vaginal lining um, these have stratified because that is protective and allows for that so epithelial tissue I've given you the function lining and secreting and protecting and for absorption so I've given you some functions and I've told you that they're a vascular and I told you that they secrete the secretion there are some specialized ones that we kind of know about like the goblet cells and I, do, I will ask you about goblet cells they're specialized epithelial they're called that because they're sort of like a wine glass shape um, they secrete mucus and I don't want you to think of mucus as a bad thing mucus is a good thing and absolutely necessary in the areas where mucus needs to be secreted it just needs to be secreted at a certain amount and not over that amount and not under it has to be just right right in homeostasis so goblet cells have a very important function and that's secreting mucus we have other cells that secrete tears cells that secrete sweat these are all secretors and they are all derived from an epithelial type of cell so lining and secreting again if we were to take a slide and we were to um, actually a, a human tissue slide and actually do a dissection and look at it we don't really expect to see every nucleus of every cell because as I said it depended on where you make the slice and so we wouldn't expect it to be so incredibly uniform as we see in drawings um, so I, that's a little bit and a basics about epithelial. Make sure that you do know those basic characteristics and those basic functions of epithelial tissue. The good thing about epithelial tissue is that depending on the margin of injury, there can be injury to epithelial tissue and you get complete regeneration which means that you would get it completely repairing itself and function store, restored now not all tissues have that ability but epithelial tissues do if the margin of injury is not so great now if the margin of injury is really huge then scarring occurs and so we'll we'll take a look at regeneration versus scarring or what we call fibrosis uh, at the end of this chapter but epithelial does have the ability to heal as long as the injury is not so severe so it has the ability to repair um, if I'm going over this thing you if I'm skipping it then it means you don't really need it um, another stratified epithelium I have already mentioned our skin this is a perfect um, slide where you're seeing the outermost dead 
squamous cells here, many, many, many layers thick. The corneum here um, is what exfoliates, is what you can feel and you can see. But if you look at this base layer of the epithelial, that is the deepest layer of our epidermis, this is where the mitosis is occurring. And cells are rapidly divide, dividing because in this layer beneath it, the dermal layer, there's blood supply. But as these cells are dividing and pushing toward the surface, from deep to superficial, they're changing anatomy and they're changing function. Their structure changes and even their function starts to change. And it's important that we actually have this process happening in exactly the right timing and um, that these layers be what we need for protection in the epidermis. So stratified squamous epithelial is what we see in the epidermis, which is our skin. And we do that chapter next on the skin. We'll start our organ system study with the skin. But these are just examples. So um, lots of pictures for you to look at and, you know, and just sort of get an idea of when you're seeing something lining that has, that are t tightly packed together or secreting, then you know it's probably epithelial tissue because that's their function. Now, the second group that we want to look at are connective tissues. Connective tissues are the most diverse in their function and they're the predominant type of tissues that we find in the body. So connective tissues have so, um, so many different types of anatomy and they do have different types of functions. But one of the major things that we see that they do as far as functions is that they are sort of binding organs together, supporting and protecting. These are all functions that we think about with connective tissues. They are highly vascular. So that is very rich in blood supply. So that is very different than epithelial, is it not? That's very different. Um, and again, they are the most abundant. They're the most widely distributed and they really do have a lot of variability in what they look like as well. There are some diseases that we associate uh, as attacking connective tissues. So you can imagine how you know devastating that that can actually be if this is the most abundant and widely, widely distributed type of tissue in the body. Let's look at a couple of different types of, of um, well, this is showing functions, so we're looking at functions here, but looking at a couple of different types of cells that we associate. And these cells, if we think about these cells and what their functions are, we could go right back to the functions of these. But we'll take a look at like macrophages, which are big. Macro means big, big. Phage means to eat. These are big eaters of our, of our system, and they're composed of white cells called monocytes. Leuco means white. That's what it means. That's the prefix that means white. Leukocyte is a white cell. There are many different types of white blood cells. There are monocytes, there are neutrophils, there are lymphocytes. These are all different types of white blood cells that have different unique functions um, that we associate. The monocytes act as our big eaters, our dump trucks. Neutrophils fight against bacteria. Lymphocytes fight, that we mostly think about lymphocytes as fighting against viruses. So I would actually want to change that maybe to reacting against viruses and I think that would be a really good thing to change because I think it's a typo in your um, book. But also even cancer cells, so lymphocytes, we have a lot of leukocytes. So these are connective tissues. It's hard to, cells that make up connective tissues. It's hard to think about blood as being a tissue since it's liquid, but it is. It is a liquid tissue that is a connective tissue. Also, we have in blood cells that are called plasma cells, which again are a special type of white blood cells that produce antibodies that protect us. These antibodies are proteins that are produced by these cells that will circulate through our bodies and protect us. When you hear about vaccines like the one we're 
you know, we're recently hearing about with um, there's so many vaccines that have been we've had for decades and we've been studying even coronavirus vaccines for more than 20 years. So this is nothing new. Immunizations are nothing new to us in science. But when you get an immunization, what that means is that you will build an antibody, this is what's hoped for, you will build an antibody response, a protein response. And as these proteins circulate throughout your body, they're just looking for a particular pathogen, something that can cause disease specifically that they've been designed for, and they will annihilate it. They will take they will take care of it before it can do you any harm. So antibodies are protective proteins that are produced by specialized white blood cells that respond to specific pathogens that we get introduced to. There are also types of mast cells that produce these again are in this category in blood that actually produce in tissues that actually produce uh, anticoagulants, these are called like heparin, that actually prevent you from having unwanted blood clotting. You know, gl blood clotting is wonderful and we need it, but we need it only up to a point. We don't want to have too much of blood clotting because then you have a thrombosis that could become an embolism, and so that wouldn't be good. But anyway, so mast cells. And then adipocytes. Adipocytes get a bad name. And the reason they get a bad name is that they are fat cells. So, um, but we have to have a certain number of adipocytes to be healthy. There is a certain percentage of adipocytes that we need to make up our fat stores so that we are healthy. And if you go back to uh, the chemistry chapter, you would have learned about how important lipids are fats are and that they all the functions that they have so we absolutely need to have a certain amount of those so these are some of the cells now fibroblast fibroblast a blast if you just look at the term blast it makes you um, when you see this term i want you to think about an early cell so fibroblast are early fibro cells that end up becoming fibrocytes. Site means cell, C-Y-T-E. These absolutely produce what is known as fibers or ground substance that help connect organ systems. I can give you a couple of examples of some of the fibers, and here they are. We, we think about a collagen, elastin. Um, these are very tough fibers that are necessary in certain tissue types that help to bind organs together and help to keep the integrity of these tissues where they need to be. I can actually also give you here an, a couple of examples of tissues and they, that you've all heard of. You've heard of ligaments and you've heard of tendons, haven't you? Ligaments are going to be these tough fibrous tissues that hold bone to bone. So in a joint, uh, a ligament is going to be attached to one bone and then attached to the, the near bone, the neighboring bone, to stabilize joints. So ligaments attach bone to bone. Tendons attach muscle to bone. So a tendon is a connective tissue that attaches muscle to bone. So those are types of, and then other examples, elastin, collagen, those types of things. Um, what else do I want to tell you? Um, I want to tell you that as far as like the diversity, we said this is the most predominant and it's the most diverse. So we, I just talked about tendons and the difference in tendons versus ligaments. Make sure you know that. We also know bones and cartilage are connective tissues. We know that um, these bones give us a ton of protection, don't they? And they give us support as well. We know that our immune protection, Im immunity simply means protection, doesn't it? So our immune system is composed of these white cells that have so many diff different types of white cells that we will learn when we get to hematology all of their, the different names and their specific functions. But we have a lot of different types that have many different functions. The bones help us with movement. Fat is a storage 
form of energy, but it also insulates. So it actually helps us with thermal regulation, regulating our temperature. And then certainly even red blood cells, they don't really talk about it much here, but red blood cells, which are part of our liquid connective tissue we call blood, red blood cells do more than just delivering oxygen to our needing our tissues that are all needing that and taking away waste products they also are going to actually discourage infections by delivering oxygen there's some microorganisms that can't grow in the presence of oxygen these are called anaerobes um, anaerobic microorganisms and as long as you've got good blood supply to your tissues those infections won't be able to take hold so, so protective our cells are that are making up our connective tissues and so diverse. So um, I do want you to know those basic characteristics of that. This dissection picture is from your um, Saladin's textbook and this dissection is just really an incredibly beautiful dissection. Uh, the complexity of a human hand um, is you know I just can't say enough about that so this dissection shows you the complexity of those structures that allow for such such dexterity uh, for us to have and I think that it's pretty amazing now as far as pictures of connective tissue we said that this is the most diverse group so there there are a lot of different cells types that come together to make these tissues so we don't expect to see one or even two or even three histology slides that all look alike if they're connective tissues. There's a lot of difference in the anatomy of these. But one of the major things that you can tell about a connective tissue is that you'll see cells, but there will be a ton of extracellular matrix. It's a lot of extracellular matrix, and we didn't see that in epithelial. In epithelial, those cells were packed together weren't they there was not a lot of extracellular matrix now in the epithelial those cells are being made by fluid but it, it it's so little because they're so compactly packed it together that we can't even see them on, with our microscope but in connective tissues you tend to see a lot of extracellular matrix the three there's really only three major connective tissues that I actually usually get students to look at um, in histology lab and one of them is actually going to be bone compact bone when you look at this this is, unit is called an osteon but when you look at compact bone there's just nothing else that really looks like compact bone except for this on a histology slide so again though um, the extracellular matrix is a calcium complex matrix that makes bone hard, appear to us as being hard. Please keep in mind, bone, these bone cells are living, dynamic cells. And even though the extracellular matrix is hardened and gives bones macroscopically that appearance that they have, bone is a living dynamic tissue if you lose blood supply to bone bone can die and then that can be a problem another type of tissue that we said is a liquid tissue is blood so when we look at a blood film and this these this blood has been stained using a stain so that the nuclei and certain properties of the cell stand out to us when we look at a stain of blood it looks like um, there's a lot of extracellular space, but that space is actually extracellular fluid that we call plasma. So plasma is the liquid part of the liquid connective tissue that we call blood. And blood is composed of different types of cells. The predominant cell are red blood cells that are anucleate, which means they do not have a nucleus without a nucleus, a nucleate, and then there are white blood cells that are nucleated, that have nucleuses, and there are many different kinds of white blood cells. When we get to hematology, we will look at 
these um, hematology stains of blood and we will take a, look, a deeper dive into that but this is a type of connective tissue so so far we've looked at bone we've looked at blood and I'm going to go back and we're going to look at adipose adipose this this fat tissue has been um, sliced and stained so that we can actually make out the plasma membranes of the individual cells. The cells look empty, but they're not empty. They're filled with fat. They're filled with lipid. And that's exactly what their function is. They're supposed to be filled with, with fat. And again, we said that fat has a particular um, function for us and that we do need it a certain amount for insulation. We need a certain amount for storage. We need a certain amount for thermoregulation. So fat actually, you know, fat tissue, uh, adipose tissue is composed of adipocytes. And these are all part of connective tissues. Fat stabilizes some of our organs. So it's important for that. And this is what they look like. Big empty cells that aren't empty though, that actually are filled with um, lipids. Cartilage. There's different types of cartilage, but cartilage belongs to connective tissue. So there's um, there are different types of it, and I'm not going to ask about that, but I would want you to know that cartilage is made of cells called chondrocytes. So chondrocytes are the cells that are made of, con of cartilage. Chondroblasts are early types of, of cartilage cells that become chondrocytes and if you ever hear about chondritis that's inflammation of cartilage tissue itis as a suffix i-t-i-s no matter where you see that suffix it means inflammation of and in this case chondritis is inflammation of cartilage tissue now cartilage tissue is connective it's a connective tissue but it is the rare type of connective tissue that is avascular. So because, you know, we said that most connective tissues have a lot of vessels, blood supply, right? But this is the one, you know, exception. There's always exceptions to rules. This is the one for connective tissue. Cartilage doesn't have much blood supply. And this is why if cartilage is injured at a joint or wherever it might be injured, you know, with cartilage in our ears and who knows where in our in our joints, um, it can take a very long time to heal. It really can. It can take a really long time to heal. So that's the reason I sort of wanted you to know about cartilage being a little bit unique in the connective tissue category. Now, then, I think that's about all I'm going to give you for connective tissues. The next category. We've looked at epithelial. We've looked at connective. The next category of tissues, nervous and muscle. Uh, let's see which one we're going to look at first. Nerve, I guess. These are nervous tissue. This category of tissue is said to be our great communicators. So nerve tissue is composed uh, of two major types of cells. The first cell that we're going to talk about are the neurons. Neurons are going to be these cells, these giant looking cells. Doesn't take much magnification to see them. On the lowest power magnification, we can see these human neurons. They're huge giant cells that almost look like an octopus, don't they? Um, they've got these extensions coming off of the cytoplasm, like arms. A neuron has these, these extensions that serve a very important function in receiving stimuli from that area, receiving stimuli, being able to be excited, receiving that stimuli, and sending a signal along to the next cells. Neurons are the great communicators. And we'll get more in depth with neurons when we get to the nervous system. But I do want you to know that these neurons, major tissue, major cell type of nerve tissue, are the great communicators. They're receiving and detecting signals and then sending messages along to other cells, other cells in the nervous system, 
other cells that are sometimes epithelial, other cells that are sometimes muscle, they can communicate with any kind of cell. The great communicators. Now, neurons get all the glory in the nervous system. But I'm going to want you to know about another type of cell, and you can see some here. These cells here, tiny little ones all you know in the background. And those cells, that other category, are called glial, glial cells. Sometimes you hear them called neural glial cells. But these cells are the helper cells to the nervous system. They protect, they assist, they way outnumber neurons. And without them, the neurons do not function well. When we get to the nervous system and we take a look at some specialized neuroglial cells and what their specialized functions are, we're going to see about diseases of those particular glial cells and what is lost when someone has a particular type of glial cell that's not working. But for right now, we want to just realize normal uh, anatomy and physiology. So in the nervous system, two major types of cells, the neurons that are the great communicators and, and great receivers of stimuli de can detect, can sense, can respond quickly. And when I say respond quickly, I mean communicate with the next cells quickly. But the glial cells, neural glial cells, Neurons can't do anything unless those neurons, those glial cells are working. And those are the helper cells to the neurons. So let's make sure we know those. Now, muscle is our fourth category of tissues that I need you to know the basics of uh, and what makes them sort of unique. Muscles can respond to the same to stimuli the same way that nervous cells can. And they're going to be responding often because of the neurons telling them to, to, but also sometimes due to chemical signaling molecules like hormones. But what muscle can do, and it uh, anatomically looks different than any of the other tissue types we saw, is that these cells can contract. They can contract. And that means the entire fiber can shorten. And then they can go back to their original. Um, a lot of people think about stretching too, but mostly it's getting back to its original as well. So, but they can contract. When they do this, heat will be given off. So shivering, you can imagine you give off heat when you're shivering. But the, this is going to be very important. And when we think about muscles, we certainly know there's an exertion of physical force. We know that movements are happen only because of muscles that are attached to bones, two different bones by way of tendons, right? So bones and tendons are connective tissues, but muscle is a tissue all itself. But when we think about skeletal muscle, this is going to be skeletal muscle is going to be attached to two separate bones. And when the muscle contracts, it means that one bone will be acted upon. It will move because of it. So we get movement because of this, right? Uh, cardiac muscle is a special kind of muscle that's only found in the heart. Cardiac is referring to the heart, and that's where it's found. We also have another type of muscle called smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is surrounding our um, surrounding organs and controls organ volume. So think about the stomach. The stomach has a, a layer of smooth muscle around it that contracts and makes the stomach act as a churn, churning up whatever you have swallowed and, and introduced to the stomach. It's going to help to churn it and to help with the digestive process. Now, when you think about swallowing food, there's a 30 foot tract before any undigested particles will come out the other end. So what causes the movement of that food through that 30 feet smooth muscle that's lining the digested tract? Your kidneys are producing urine and as it they produce urine it goes into these little hollow muscular tubes called ureters and the ureters take it to a, a um, bladder 
which is a fluid filled sac really um, that is has smooth muscle surrounding it so the ureters the bladder and the urethra are all surrounded by smooth muscle and as that muscle those muscles are contracting it's sending substances that are within on a, in a certain path controlling the organ volumes so skeletal muscle attached to bone for movement cardiac muscle is in our heart to pump blood and smooth muscle surrounding body organs to control organ volume so this is what these three types of mus muscular tissue are actually doing and what their functions are if we looked at the histology slide each of these three categories skeletal muscle cardiac muscle and smooth muscle look a little different from each other on histology slides and they are supposed to because they have slightly different functions skeletal muscles look like this uh, on a pathology slide histology slide cardiac muscle looks like this instead of being so parallel the fibers with little um, nuclei kind of sandwiched between cardiac muscle is very branchy looking it's got lots of branches it's got these discs that allow for rapid um, signaling so that the muscle contracts you know kind of all at the same time and smooth muscle has much larger looking nuclei than it anyway they look a little different and this is this is what we know another major difference in these three categories is that um, skeletal muscle is under voluntary control you control that by thinking about it you control how you write your notes you control how you get up and take a break you control how you, you know, drink your coffee or you know speaking even so you're controlling that it's voluntary cardiac muscle you don't have to think about it's autonomic it has a built-in pacemaker and I do think it would be important that you actually know that the heart muscle is has its own built-in pacemaker it's called the sinoatrial node I'll spell that s-i-n-o a T R I A L sinoatrial node. It's called that because it it provides a sinus rhythm, and it's located in the upper chamber of the heart called the atrium. So sinoatrial node is a little group of cells that start functioning around the late part of embryonic development, around eight weeks. That pacemaker group of cells is signal is sending an electrical current through the heart. And as it sends an electrical current through the heart, that signal can be sent rapidly because of these, they're called the intercalated discs. You don't need to know that. But they're, they're, it's sent really rapidly through the heart so that you get this rhythm that is occurring because of this pacemaker. You don't have to think about it. It would be terrible if we had to think about each heartbeat, wouldn't it? We would have no time to do anything else. Now, your heartbeat and rate is also influenced by dozens of other things, other chemicals, hormones, and neurotransmitters. But the actual pacemaker is built in, and that is the SA node, which stands for sinoatrial node, in that upper right chamber of the heart. Now, smooth muscle is under involuntary control. We said smooth muscle is surrounding our blood vessels, it's surrounding our GI tract, it's surrounding our, uh, you know, our vessels, our uh, vessels that actually transport like urine and whatever. So that's under control of, of the endocrine system so chemical signaling molecules so that is also involuntary you don't have to think about it so skeletal muscle voluntary control the heart cardiac muscle pacemaker and smooth muscle involuntary control due to neurotransmitters and hormones so alright so there's just some difference in the muscle categories now 
let's look at some so those are your four categories epithelial connective um, nerve and muscle I hope you know some individual things about each and some categories of each and they're especially especially their specialized functions of each so now let's look at um, the cell junctions that we do see in epithelial tissue there are a couple of different types of and these are just based on their anatomy really there's different types of connections holding cells together they're called tight junctions gap junctions and desmosomes is one particular group desmosomes um, the, the, it's suggesting to you that it sort of holds holds cells together like a clothing snap like you know you do have shirts that have snaps right um, the reason I'm really bringing this up is that there's some diseases that actually attack these connections these junctions especially the desmosomes there's an autoimmune disease that actually and I don't know if they, they don't have it in your it's kind of unusual they don't have it in your notes but I'm going to give it to you there is a an autoimmune I think it's in your deeper insights in this chapter but there's an autoimmune disease called pemphigus pemphigus this is a uh, autoimmune disease where your own immune cells start attacking these junctions and can start causing these junctions to break and what you'll tend to see is that there will be these vesicles forming like little blisters you all know that a blister is just when the the epithelial lifts away from the tissue beneath the, the basement membrane of it the layer beneath it we don't really want that happening you know that is considered to not be a good thing even if you've just rubbed a blister from a friction um, from work like you know working in the garden or doing whatever or having a sunburn or having a blister for whatever reason or burning yourself on a stove that's damaging to those tissues and you know if it's done because of something external that you know you had injury to that's one thing but when this is happening from the inside out this can be not great this can be actually kind of awful so like most autoimmune diseases there's a huge spectrum that you see as far as severity so uh, and that's with most autoimmune diseases in this particular case usually it's going to be a limited area like maybe the throat or the back of the neck or on the trunk there'll be an area where these little vesicles blisters are forming that can form and they kind of come and go so it's irritating and maybe annoying and whatnot but it can take a long time to get the diagnosis for that right because they kind of come and go but then you can also see people with this autoimmune disease that on the other end of the spectrum they have widespread this is happening widespread and it's very severe and it can be life-threatening so um, our junctions that hold our epithelial cells together need to be working they need to be working and there's several different types desmosome, desmosomes tight junctions and gap junctions so um, glands are going to be glands are going to be organs that secrete so these are going to be organs that secrete substances and secretions are certainly products that are useful to the body they each have their own different functions the different types of secretions that we think about like digestive enzymes they're talking about here tears are important right the fluids that bathe our heart the fluids that bathe our lung that that actually reduce friction around our lungs pleural fluid cardiac pericardial fluid they all serve functions and they're important to have the synovial fluid that actually lubricates and protects our joints so when we think about these secretions um, these are good things and we want them we want them working now um, exocrine versus endocrine glands I think I've given you this but we'll do it again exo means that these products will eventually exit the body so they're going to be sent into ducts so a perfect example some examples that should make sense are sweat mammary 
milk, right, milk, and tears. Those are perfect examples. The endocrine glands are going to secrete their products into the, that stay within the system. And those, the major ones we think about are hormones. A hormone is a molecule that signals a reaction in another cell. So these are signaling molecules. So when they are released from one cell, they're going to have an effect on another cell. And we need them. Hormones rule and rock our world. And when I say that, I don't, I'm not talking about just sex, though that's a major thing we think about. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about everything. <laughs> I'm talking about keeping us in homeostasis. We had, when I talked, gave you an example of negative feedback. We said it's the nervous system that detects where set points are and if things are getting too high and too low. But that great communicator, the nervous system cells, detect and then send a signal to effector cells, which are often endocrine glands, that release their hormones to effect the change that's going to happen because of the stimulus. We said that it's usually a negative feedback, meaning that the original stimulus detected will be reversed. If it was too high, things will be brought back down and lower. If it's too low, it will be reversed and brought back up. So into, often through endocrine secretion of hormones. Now, um, what else did I want to tell you about this? Some glands can act as both endocrine and exocrine, and there are different types of secretions. I do think it's a good idea for you to know that serous glands produce very thin, watery secretions, things that you think of like sweat, milk, tears, and digestive juices. Mucus glands obviously secrete mucus, right? We said their goblet cells in particular are the name of the cells that do that. Um, again, there are going to be mixed glands that can do both. For example, the pancreas. The pancreas is an endocrine gland when it produces insulin and glucagon. They are released into the bloodstream. But when it secretes through their duct, there's a duct that runs through the pancreas that joins to the small intestines. That's the pancreatic secretions are digestive in their uh, properties and they will be used for digestion, for chemical breaking down of mostly proteins, but so also some carbohydrates. So a perfect example is a, um, the pancreas as being a mixed kind of gland. We also have cytogenic glands. Genic meaning that genesis is the beginning of cells, the beginning of cells, cytogenic glands that produce whole cells like sperm and eggs. And again, sperm have to leave the male body. They need to be able to leave and exit, don't they? And sperm, um, if they meet an egg, this is going to uh, allow for fertilization. And again, it has to be an exit route for that. So I hope that kind of makes sense. I am going to talk more about miracrine and apricot glands when we get to the skin, but these are going to be sweat When we think about um, the apricot glands, we often think about sweat glands that happen at puberty, and then also miracrine, um, mammary glands for milk. These miracrine glands have secrete through exocytosis, so like tears, pancreas, all of these. I don't ask you anything about this at this time. So there are different types of secretion um, into these ducts and into the pores. And so that's, again, just a little bit, you don't, I'm not going to ask you anything about that. But anyway, so let's see what else I want you to know. Oh, so I would like you to know some terminology here as far as tissue growth goes. These, this is terminology that you will sometimes hear associated with disease and pathology. So this, these are terms I definitely want you to know. When we think about just tissue growth, we understand that that's always occurring, um, certainly during development until we get to full growth potential. But we also have cells that are growing uh, even throughout our life and having to repair. Hyperplasia, 
is going to be uh, tissue growth through cell multiplication. So there, this is going to be tissue growth with that. Hypertrophy means enlargement of the pre-existing cells. So oftentimes you hear about hypertrophic hearts where the hearts have actually gotten large and have enlarged and uh, can be a problem now. Certainly body fat. Um, fat cells, when, when someone is gaining weight, they're not really usually adding cells. It's just that the cell, the fat cells that are already there are, are enlarging, um, storing fat. So it's not like you're actually getting more cells. You're just the cells that are already there are uh, storing fat. Neoplasia. This is a term that means development of a tumor in neoplasm. So this is a tumor related. It may be benign or it could be malignant. When we think about benign, we think about encapsulated. It's encapsulated. It's in one spot. It's not going anywhere. It's benign. When we think about malignant tumors, they are not encapsulated. And unfortunately, cells can move from those sites and take up um, growth in other places. And we call that metastasis. So those are the difference. Um, those are the difference in those terms. Differentiation, I've explained to you that we, when we think about early undifferentiated cells, they're called stem cells. But as these, these cells take on very specialized functions, then we, we say that they are differentiating and they are maturing into the cell type that they're going to become, epithelial, connective, muscle, or nerve. Metaplasia is a term that you often don't hear in normal anatomy and physiology, even though on occasion during development this happens normally. But typically in medicine, when you hear this term, it's not a good term. Typically, when you hear this in medicine, it means that there has been like cancerous changes if metaplasia has occurred. But, but this term literally means changing from one type of mature tissue to another. Again, this does happen sometimes in normal development. And a perfect example of this would be, uh, of normal, would be in the vagina prior to puberty. The, the vaginal lining prior to puberty is simple epithelium, which is not protective. So the vagina should not be functioning as a receptacle prior to puberty for anything. But with the onset of the hormones that are happening a couple of years before the first menses or menstrual cycle, those tissues start to change to stratified squamous. And now they are going to function as a, as a distensible muscular tube that, you know, friction is, is fine and it's actually developed for that, but not prior to puberty. So that's metaplasia happening in a normal developmental sequence. Typically though, as I said, when you hear this term in medicine, it's not going to be a good thing. It's going to be something that means that there's been potential changes to the tissue that are leading to uh, mutational or, or um, cancerous types of changes or potentials. Okay, so that's metaplasia. I've talked about stem cells. Um, stem cells, the earlier the stem cell, the more potential that cell can become what you need. So we refer to plasticity as the um, ability to become whatever you need. So the more plasticity it, it has, the more ability it has to become what you need. And these are just some, I don't ask you about these terms, but those are some of the terms related to embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells. So for tissue repair, I've already mentioned to you the idea about regeneration versus fibrosis. So in regeneration, it means that the cells will repair, will um, replace themselves and have full function after injury or after, you know, pathology or whatever, you're going to have replacement and full function. Fibrosis or what is sometimes referred to as a fibrotic event means that they will not be replaced and there will be a scar 
happening there and there's no function restored at that site. So this uh, not restoring normal function if there's a fibrotic event or a process called fibrosis. There, are, there is a um, term that we call keloiding. A keloid is an excessive scar. So not just a normal scar that's on the margin of where the injury happened, but one that becomes excessive is a keloid. That process is called keloiding, um, and that can actually cause problems as well. Usually, we think about keloids as being an aesthetic kind of difference, you know, so just aesthetically, somebody might not be pleased. Um, sometimes they're done intentionally with the keloiding, so whatever. But, but those, those are the terms that you think about with tissue repair. So again, as long as the margin of injury is not so great, a lot of times epithelial, this is epithelial, see it lining, this is, this is connective because you can see all the, excuse me, extracellular matrix and blood vessels. So connective epithelial. Epithelial can readily um, regenerate as long as the margins aren't too, too large at the injury. But uh, connective tissues, again, can sometimes do this with the fibroblast, replacing fibrocytes that are going to regenerate, but it can also scar. If there's too much fibroblast activity, then it causes fibrosis to happen and scarring. So you can just take a look a little bit at that. Um, okay, so that's tissue repair. I want you to know these terms, atrophy, versus necrosis, they're very different. Atrophy means that there's been a shrinkage of the tissue uh, due to lack of use usually or loss of, of function at that site. So atrophy can be because someone has been bedridden and their muscles are atrophying, it affects their skeletal system as well. So that can happen can be uh, because of injury, like I said, or just lack of use, somebody becoming less mobile. Um, and it's a normal process of aging as well, this atrophy. Necrosis is very different. Necrosis is premature death to the tissue. And that's going to happen because of trauma, because of toxins that might be from infections, or it could be from introduced chemicals, whatnot. But Necrosis is premature pathological death. When we think of an infarction, that means a sudden lack of blood supply. Blood has to be in constant supply to our tissues, nourishing our tissues with nutrients, supplying oxygen for ATP production, and taking away waste products. Constant supply. All of our tissues have to have a constant supply of oxygen. Some more tissues are more sensitive to a lack of oxygen than others. So if a sudden decrease in blood supply happens, it's called an infarction. We hear often of myocardial infarctions, which means the muscle, that, that would literally be broken down to mean the muscle of the heart losing blood supply. That's what myocardial infarction means, literally. And people call that a heart attack, don't they? But infarctions can happen in any organ and are not good to hear about in any organ because it will cause death to those tissues. Gangrene is going to be um, a condition that can happen where the tissues die. And we typically hear about gas gangrene. That is because of a particular bacterium. And I am going to want you all to know that bacterium. It's called uh, Clostridium perfringens. This is a bacterium. This is the genus name and species name of a bacterium that causes gangrene. So Clostridium perfringens. Clostridium perfringens is an anaerobe, which means that it can't, it can't survive if there's oxygen present. So if you had good blood supply, you wouldn't have this infection. But if blood supply gets cut off, if red cells can't get there to deliver oxygen, you're at risk 
of this bacterium causing an infection. And if this gets to the bloodstream, if it gets from those dead tissues that might be your toes or your feet or fingers or you know wherever the gangrene is happening, um, then if it gets to the bloodstream, the risk of mortality goes sky high, even with medical intervention. This is why people who have gangrene have to have amputations. You have to amputate that area off or that person will eventually die. They will, that's 100%, would die from um, sepsis, which is actively growing microbes in the bloodstream. That's what sepsis means. Actively growing microorganisms in the bloodstream. In this case, if it was gangrene, in this case, it would be the bacterium called Clostridium perfringens, which is really deadly. So, um, decubitus ulcers are what people call a bed sore. That's what, well, people call it a bed sore, but in medicine we refer to them as decubitus ulcers. These are because of pressure on areas, and it can be a, as much pressure as just like your elbow or a hip or, you know, um, I've seen bed sores in so many patients and a lot of times people think that bed sores are all preventable but the fact is they're just really not all preventable. Many of them are preventable with patients being turned and the proper beds now that change pressure points and whatnot but they're not all preventable. There's some patients whose skin the skin is so broken down because their livers aren't functioning and their nutrient levels aren't where they need to be that no matter what you do, their skin is going, it's not going to hold up. And, and these decubitus ulcers can form. So while I would say that, that most bed sores could be preventable if, if there were perfect scenarios happening with care and equipment, um, not all. Are preventable and they're really uh, a very sad thing to watch. Decubitus ulcers are really hard for patients. Um, it's well I say it's hard to watch but it would be hard to have one too um, for these patients. So okay. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. So we think about um, cells. Cells have lifespans. <laughs> cells have a certain number of cycles they should go through and then they should die because they need to get out of the way. So even within one organism, one individual, we have programmed cell death happening all the time and this is, this is referred to as apoptosis. So, um, and that is a normal kind of process that happens. What else do I want you to know? This is this is actually, this last little part is talking about um, tissue engineering and how skin grafts are, are available now and how people are replacing certain skin type, types of tissues with these engineered um, tissues that we're getting to grow in a lab, which is kind of wonderful because before then it was, you were completely dependent on donors and um, cadavers and you know other things that people would have re rejections to so there's less like likely chance of actually rejections with some of these there's a stem cell controversy a lot of people um, misunderstand what stem cell research is doing but um, it's usually through a real lack of understanding of the science and understanding what's going on in stem cell um, I'm going to make a note to myself that this might be something we going to continue our conversation over. Um, and stems, embryo, there's really no such thing as embryonic stem cell um, research. A lot of people are so opposed to it because they think, and they're being misled uh, for various reasons, usually political, um, they think that these stem cells are coming from aborted fetuses, and that has never happened. That is not the case. These stem cells are coming from petri dishes of cells that have never been in the uterus. Never. So they are early cells. They are early cells that we are keeping alive in, in, in augers, but they are not, have never been in the uterus. These cells haven't. And we keep cells going all the time. 
um, in science and in pathology at labs. We do this all the time. So unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation about stem cells and embryonic stem cells. But what isn't um, an untrue fact is how much has happened as far as treating patients who have cardiac muscle failure and these cells have been introduced to help to rebuild the heart muscle. Uh, spinal cord injuries which had thought to be 100% permanent, permanent paralysis with no hope are now there's some hope. Uh, introducing beta islet cells into the pancreas so that they start producing insulin again for type 1 diabetics. So there have been so much, there's been a lot done um, effectively to help to treat patients with using the stem cell research and using stem cells in genetic engineering. Adult stem cells are also um, studied, but adult stem cells have more of a limited uh, ability to help because as I said, the earlier the stem cell, the more potential the cell has of becoming what you need. So there is a lot, um, there's a lot of hope with stem cells and stem cell research research and helping to cure and helping to support people with diseases that we had thought were going to be 100% fatal or not being able to regain sort um, function at the sites. So this is our foundation of histology, our study of tissues, our four basic types that we had. I hope you enjoyed it because we are now ready in the next section to start with our organ systems. The first organ system that we will study and look at will be the skin, the integumentary system, and I'm looking forward to it. So best wishes to you all and thank you for your your attention to this topic.